Once again, Decoder Ring Theater presents another page from the casebook of that master of mystery, that sultan of sleuthing, Martin Bracknell's immortal detective, Black Jack Justice, starring Christopher Mott as Jack and Andrea Lyons as Trixie Dixon, girl detective. The name's Dixon. Trixie Dixon, girl detective. Ask ten people what they think of the police and you'll get ten different answers. Me? I've always had a soft spot for them. I've always been a sucker for a man in uniform. Some people feel differently. Blackjack, for instance. To Jack, the boys in blue are an ill wind that usually blows no good. Sitting in the interrogation room listening to the wind that bellowed out of Lieutenant Sabian, I was starting to see his point. Dixon, I'm asking you for the last time. Where's your boss? That was the last time? Yes. Good. Well? Well what? Where's your boss? Another broken promise. Mother always said not to get involved with a policeman. You're not going to wiseacre your way out of this one, Dixon. This is a murder investigation, and around here we tend to take those fairly seriously. Well, speaking as a taxpayer, I'm thrilled. Look, I want a straight answer, and I want it now, or I book you as an accessory. A straight answer? Sure, kitten. First of all, I don't have a boss. Jack Justice is my partner. That's not what... Not what it says on the door, I know. Secondly, for the 45th time, I'm not answering questions till my lawyer gets here. You're not being charged with anything! Say, that's good news. A minute ago, I was being charged as an accessory. I don't know what your game is, but while I'm wasting time with you, a murderer is running free. You think that's funny? I got a woman shot dead in cold blood and who knows how many other people in danger, and I have to sit here and be cute with you? You're going to tell me where Jack Justice is, or I'm going to find a way to make you very, very sorry. What do you think about that? Not bad. Nice non-specific threat. Lots of growling and slamming the table. I think you'd have most girls in tears with that one. I also think you're a blowhard and a bully. It's not that I can't cry, Sabian. I can cry real good in front of a disciplinary committee or a judge if I feel so inclined. Now, are you going to call my lawyer or what? Trixie, don't say another word. Lieutenant Sabian, I'll thank you for that, Molly. You're Dixon's lawyer? Molly Cameron, attorney at law. Why is my client in handcuffs? Nelson, get those cuffs off her. All right, Dixon. Your lawyer's here. Now, would you mind answering a few questions or should we all have tea first? Just a minute. She's got immunity on anything revealed in this interrogation. This is a murder investigation, Counselor. I can't give out hall passes. Nothing in her statement itself will be used against her unless she talks her way into a murder charge. Best I can do. It's all right, Molly. They're not after me, are you, Sabian? They're after Jack. Jack? Oh. Well, shall I call the hangman, Lieutenant, or would you rather? Jack and Molly used to date. (laughs) Date... Greco-Roman wrestling, you say potato. Jeez, now there's two of them. All right, Dixon, spill it. Well, since you asked so nicely, it all started a couple of weeks ago. I'm not interested in a couple of weeks ago. I want to know where Jack Justice is. Baby, and there's a rhythm to these things. If you interrupt me, I lose my place. Ah, Christmas. Just sit there and make notes, Lieutenant. Trixie's awfully thorough. That's what I'm afraid of. It all started a couple of weeks ago. Jack and I were engaged in one of a private detective's favorite pursuits, a staring contest. Jack was staring at the door, and I was staring at the phone. Ha! I win again. All right, hotshot. Don't leave the pigeon out on the ledge. Can I help you? Is this Jack Justice Investigations? Our guest wasn't much to look at. Arthur Moran, five foot seven, actuary for an insurance company. 47, with a wife 15 years his junior. You can guess why he knocked on the door. Mr. Moran, I know how you feel. A fellow would rather have a gun to his temple than live every day wondering about his own wife. If your suspicions are wrong, then you should know that so you can relax. But if your suspicions are right, well, you should know that too. I'm afraid the whole thing is just too humiliating. There's no need to feel like that, Mr. Moran. We're professionals, and I'm sorry to say this kind of work is more and more common these days. We've handled this before. We can get the goods on Mrs. Moran, if... God forbid there are any goods to be got. And if not, we can put her in the clear once and for all. A week's surveillance and you'll have names, dates, addresses, and pictures. No. No pictures. Well, Mr. Moran, help me out here, Trix. Mr. Moran, proof of infidelity can be very important should this come down to a... a divorce case, sir. 
Getting photos now would probably save you time and money later on. It just seems so... No. I'm afraid I really must insist. No photographs. We tried to convince him, but he wouldn't have it. He was adamant, no pictures. Jack shrugged it off, said he'd want pictures all right, but we'd warned him fair and square. When he wanted proof later, he could pay all over again. His money, said Jack, and we both knew we could use it. We followed Mrs. Moran for a week. She was tall, and she sure turned a lot of heads walking down the street all right. It wasn't easy to see what she'd seen in Arthur Moran in the first place, but it didn't make it right. Sure enough, Wednesday afternoon, she made her way to a small apartment block on the other side of town. She walked up three flights and knocked on the door of room 422. A dark-haired man answered the door, and they both disappeared. Jack tailed the man when he left. He went home to a nice place uptown. He was a doctor, name of Brochet. Had a practice in the Cumberland building. He had the apartment rented out under his middle name, which is pretty unoriginal. But it's just possible he hadn't done this before. Possible, but unlikely. We watched the apartment for a few more days. They didn't make an appearance. We reported to Mr. Moran, told him all we knew. His reaction was not at all what we had expected. No. No, I can't believe it. You must have been mistaken. There's no mistake, Mr. Moran. Can I get you a drink at all? I'll tell you what I want. I want you to watch this apartment of yours, day and night, for a week, and give me a thorough report of any... traffic. Whatever you say. Maybe this time some photographs will convince you. No, Mr. Justice. I've said it before, and I will say it again. I am the client, and I insist no photos. So began week two of what we come to call Moran's Folly. This time it was even easier. Instead of following Mrs. Moran around, we took a space in the office building across the way and waited for the chicken to come back to roost. And they sure weren't shy about it either. I don't know if they were exhibitionists or just didn't think anybody was looking, but they never made a motion to close the blinds that covered the big picture window in the bedroom. At the end of the week, a report to Moran was just as we'd expected. Wednesday afternoon. Same time, same place. It seems the good doctor has found a replacement for his golf game. Jack. I'm sorry, Mr. Moran, but that's the way it is. Your wife meets this Dr. Brochet on Wednesday afternoons at an apartment in a neighborhood neither is likely to be recognized in. The rest of the time, the apartment sits empty. Every indication says this has been going on for a while, and nothing indicates it's going to stop anytime soon. Arthur Moran had gone away angry. Angry at us. Said we'd wasted his time and taken his money for nothing. But the next afternoon, he was back with an apology and a new assignment. I need to be sure. I need to see for myself. I need... I need pictures. Jack just shook his head a little. I think he felt sorry for Moran. He knew the little guy didn't feel right about snooping on his wife, and it meant a case that would have been closed in three days was still open. But what was bad for Moran's bank balance was good for the agency, and we packed our kit and headed back to our vantage point the next afternoon. Boy, oh boy. Peeping Tom time. My mother would be thrilled. Your mother strikes me as a closet voyeur. Leave my mother out of this. I can't help it if she's sweet on me. She just likes the company of a man her own age. Ouch. Say, looks like we got movement over there. Is it Mrs. Moran? Better. It's Dr. Casanova. Why better? Because we'll get a nice shot of him opening the door for her. Smile, Pally. If I know my spiteful husbands, your wife will be seeing these snapshots, too. Dr. Brochet wasn't alone for very long. When we'd arrived, the Venetian blinds in the bedroom were already closed. Jack had cursed under his breath, but it didn't matter all that much. The two of them carried on in the hallway in full view of our camera for a good long while and got far enough along in the proceedings to convince Mr. Moran we'd been straight with him. Finally, Brochet reappeared in the hallway. He looked back into the bedroom, put on his jacket, picked up his hat, and left, giving the hallway a quick check on the way. Jack snapped a few close-ups of Brochet on the way out, and a few more of him leaving the building. The room was still quiet. An hour went by. We figured the lady was freshening up. Another hour went by. She could have been taking a nap. Soon it was quarter to six, still no sign of Mrs. Moran. Something wasn't right here. I stayed in the window with the camera and Jack crossed the street to knock on the apartment door. Eight minutes later, Jack must have been tired of waiting because the front door opened, and as he walked up the hallway, he grinned and winked in the direction of the camera. He looked into the bedroom, then back to the window. His face was grim. 
He went into the bedroom and left my line of sight. A few seconds later, a small man with a dark complexion swung open the front door hesitantly. He seemed to be calling out to anyone in the apartment. He looked into the bedroom, jumped back, and ran out of the apartment top speed. I could hear him yelping from across the street. I never saw Jack leave, and by the time I got to the street level, you bulls were all over the place. You've got the camera. Your boys in the lab should have the film developed soon enough. Besides that, I can't tell you much. I don't know where Jack went, where he is now, or even what you want him for. What we want him for? Sister, ain't that obvious? Blackjack Justice is wanted for the murder of Mrs. Janet Moran. You are listening to Blackjack Justice from DecoderRingTheater.com. The name's Justice. Jack Justice. In my line, things are rarely simple. Since I hung up my shingle, I've been stood up and shook down. I've been stabbed, sapped, sucker-punched, and shot at. That's why there's nothing that gets under my collar quite like somebody taking a nice, simple job and turning it into a hassle. And no disrespect to the memory of the late Mrs. Moran, but that's just what her killer has done to me. The lock hadn't been difficult to work. I left the door half open in case of a sudden need to beat a hasty retreat. Mistake number one. But, after all, our client hadn't said a word about paying social calls on his wife. Just get pictures of her and her lover. We'd done that all right. But while she was out of our sight, someone had to put a bullet right smack between her overly sculpted eyebrows and her long blonde hair. It had been a few hours by the look of her. The blinds in the bedroom window were closed, but we'd had a camera trained on the apartment door, and the only person to go through it had been her lover, Dr. Brochet. The last thing a Seamus needs to read in the papers is a report of how he sat watching an apartment containing only a beautiful corpse while the murderer made tracks. So as soon as I saw the lady sprawled on the floor, I knew I had to get my hands on Brochet before the law did. Private Eye Nab's killer makes a better headline than Justice is Blind. Hello? Is anybody home? (laughs) You left your door open. Hey, you, what are you doing? I whipped round and was face to face with a small man with a dark complexion and a wild look in his eye. Before I could say a word, he'd taken in the gory scene, jump to a wild conclusion or two, and run out of the room shrieking like a little girl. I had to act fast. If I waited to explain myself to the boys in blue, they'd have me downtown faster than you can say Jack Robinson, and I could spend the few remaining hours before the morning edition went to press sweating it out in an interrogation room, in which case I might as well close the agency and try my hand farming bananas at the Arctic Circle. I could hear the little man pounding on doors, yelling blue murder. The place would be swarming with John Laws soon. There were footsteps in the hallway. I ducked into the next room and saw the fire escape outside the open window. I climbed out on the landing and raced down the stairs. I hit the bottom at top speed. The escape ladder was already down and I climbed it without another thought. I could hear the sirens of the bulls arriving on the scene and I made tracks down the alley. Trixie could handle the cops. She knew the routine. Hey, taxi! Where to, Mac? The Cumberland Building and step on it. I made tracks as fast as I could to Brochet's office. By now it was after six, and I figured the odds of him being there were slim to none. But if possible, I wanted to take him alone. I never liked doing this kind of thing in front of a man's family. Too many variables. My cabby was a big man, with half the Dead Sea flowing out from under his salt-stained cap. He liked to make small talk, and was under the mistaken impression that everyone shared his enthusiasm for the Dodgers. I pretended to be interested and let him ramble, figuring he'd be too involved with himself to pay much attention to me. Mistake number two. He insisted on waiting outside while I checked the offices, which were dark and locked up tight, with a carefully lettered sign behind the glass inviting me to come back tomorrow at 10.30 or call for an appointment. The baseball fan drove me uptown to Brochet's home and I sent him away. The constant rambling punctuated by, Don't you think? was too much to take. I took a good look at Brochet's house. This cat had it easy. Why should he risk it all by shooting the Moran dame? Maybe she threatened to spill. Not that she didn't have a pretty sweet deal herself. Didn't make a lot of sense, but it's like that sometimes. Maybe Brochet just got tired of her and had the bad luck to do it with somebody watching. I don't much care. There were no lights on inside. I rang the bell and waited. By the time I was sure there was no one home, the sly movements of lace curtains from the houses to the right and left made me think twice about letting myself in. There's no burglar alarm in the world as effective as nosy neighbors. I took a walk down the block looking for a place to cool my jets till Dr. and Mrs. Brochet got back from wherever nice fellas take their wives while still reeking of their girlfriend's perfume. 
I rang the office in Trixie's apartment from a payphone. No dice. Which meant she was probably downtown. I wondered how much time I had. All of a sudden, the car pulled up, and I had a familiar voice. Hey. Hey, Blackjack. Get in the car. Hey, Freddy. What are you doing up here? It was Freddy Hawthorne, small-time operator and an occasional broker of inside information. Trixie called him Freddy the Finger, mostly because it really bothered him. Freddy dealt a little in tips for detectives of the strictly private variety, but he was no pigeon. What he was doing in this neck of the woods, I don't want to know. For Pete's sake, Blackjack, get in the car. All right, all right. Hey, Freddy, slow down. I'm waiting for a friend to come home. Jack, you've only got one friend in this neighborhood, and it's old Freddy Hawthorne, see? All right, take it easy a minute. I'm right in the middle of something here. I'll say you are. What's that supposed to mean? The bulls are turning the whole upside down town looking for you. You're lucky old Freddy found you first. What are you on about, Freddy? There's a whole, uh, what do you call it? A dragnet out for you. A dragnet? For what? On account of that dame you iced. Dame I... Freddy, I haven't iced anybody in weeks, okay? That's what you say. Old Betsy, she says different. That's when Freddy pulls an old blanket off the seat between us to reveal his pride and joy. A stolen police radio. Just the kind of thing that comes in handy when half your racket is playing lookout for the real crooks. We rolled up the windows and switched it on low. Sure enough, half the talk on the squawk box was all about yours truly. The latest was a report from a caddy saying he'd taken a fare that matched my description to the Cumberland building and an address uptown. I muttered a private hex on the Dodgers and Freddy made tracks in the direction of nowhere in particular. If they weren't looking for Brochet yet, it meant Trixie was still stalling to give me time. But why? Based on not much of anything, with a bull so sure it was me that pulled the trigger. Sabian. It's gotta be Sabian. Who? Lieutenant Vic Sabian. He's never exactly been my biggest fan. His list of usual suspects is one guy long. Which is odd, considering he's never hung me yet. Maybe this time he figures I'm being lucky. Sabian's not much of a human being, but he's an okay cop. If he's on the case, he wants the real killer even more than he wants it to be me. So this lady, she was sleeping around, huh, Jack? I don't know that there was much sleeping going on, but I get your general drift. Boy, oh boy. If I ever caught my Alice at that, I don't know what I'd do. What do you figure Alice would do if she ever caught you? That's easy. Yeah. Yeah. So where are we going, Blackjack? Do me a favor, Freddy. Pull over by that payphone. Freddy was nervous about stopping the car, but he did it right enough. I stepped out, trying to look nonchalant, but not so nonchalant as to attract attention, which is a heck of a tightrope to do the foxtrot on. I closed the booth behind me, dropped a nickel in the slot, and called my lawyer. Francis, Jack Justice. Oh, you've heard. Don't start salivating over fees yet, Francis. I'm even more innocent than usual. Listen, my gut tells me Trixie's having tea and cookies with Lieutenant Sabian right now. Think you can get a message in to Molly Cameron? Good. Now listen carefully. Who is it? It's the police, Mr. Moran. It's about your wife. My wife? But I've just come back from identifying her body. Yes, sir. There's a new development. Uh, Well, I... Yes, all right. One moment. You! That's right, Mr. Moran. Sorry if it's a little late for social calls. You killed my wife! You've been talking to Lieutenant Sabian, I see. Don't get too excited. He thinks I kill a lot of people. Step back inside, Mr. Moran. And don't get cute. This pistol is aimed right at your heart. What are you doing? Just step inside, Moran. No, don't bother with the door. I won't be staying long. Here, step into this room with me. Nice and slow. Are you going to shoot me, too? Oh, you're good. You're very, very good. I didn't think you had it in you, Moran. What do you mean? You seemed so mild-mannered. Didn't feel quite right having your wife tailed. Didn't want any pictures. But once you were sure, you found the will and a way, didn't you? I... We told you where the apartment was. We told you it was empty six days a week. You went away mad, but you thought it out. You scoped the place. I don't know how you got in the first time, but you did it. Maybe you bribed the super, maybe you broke in. Someone will have seen you. You set things up just the way you wanted, with the window and the fire escape. Then you came back to us, wanting proof. Wanting pictures. You're talking nonsense. You figured those pictures would be all you needed to put your wife's lover away. You got your revenge on both of them for making a fool of you. You can't prove any of this. It's not my job to prove anything, Moran. That's for the cops and the prosecutors. You figured as long as we saw two people enter and one leave, we wouldn't ask any more questions. 
but last week we spent seven days staring at that apartment, and the blinds were never down. When Brochet showed up at the love nest this week, the blinds were already down. Someone had been in there. Someone who didn't want us to see everything. And your wife and the good doctor weren't exactly modest. I don't know how long you waited in the next room, or how you knew she'd stay longer than he would. Could be one of those things you learn in the course of being married to someone I wouldn't know. Maybe you didn't care, as long as one of them was dead and the other in jail. I don't know and I don't give a damn. Because I know the truth. You killed your wife. What if I did, smart guy? What if I did? She was a tramp, made a fool of me. He's just as bad. Why should I be the only one to suffer? You took the information we brought you and used it to commit murder. So what? You'll never prove it. And the police think you did it. See, that's just bad luck. You knew it, this. Sabian always thinks I did it. And he always ends up with the right guy behind bars. Not this time. By the time they finish with you and Brochet, I'll be long gone. You think you can get away with murder? I can, and I will. And that gun's not going to stop me. Yeah? How about this one? Or this one? Who? Mr. Moran, allow me to introduce you to Lieutenant Sabian. Miss Dixon, you already know. Charmed, I'm sure. Justice got a message to me through his partner's lawyer. We followed the two of you in and heard your confession from the hall. <laughs> It'll never stick. I was at gunpoint. You don't get it, do you, Moran? That confession will be enough to hold you while Sabian and his boys find out where you fouled up. You're an amateur, and then not. You killed your wife, and they're going to see you swing for it. All right, Moran, let's go. Oh, and Mr. Moran? What is it? The police were kind enough to develop the photos free of charge, but you still owe us $50 for this afternoon. We'll be sending you a bill. <sighs> Sometimes the answer is right in front of your eyes. Sometimes you're so busy chasing what you think you saw, you can't be bothered to stop and look again. Arthur Moran almost flew in under our radar. If he'd run right away, or if he'd waited, days, weeks, months. But he tried to get cute, tried to use us as agents of his revenge. Sometimes justice is blind. But not today, Arthur Moran. Not today. Blackjack Justice, Episode 3, Justice is Blind, was written and directed by Greg Taylor and starred Christopher Mott and Andrea Lyons with additional voices provided by Leslie Livingston, Jonathan Lear, Peter Nichol, and Greg Taylor. This recording and the story, characters, and situations depicted within are the property of their author and creator and protected by copyright. Until next time, remember, DecoderRingTheater.com is your address to adventure. Mm-hmm.